Um, <laughs> but you need people to come to your movies, right? So if you make an exciting movie, it makes people want to come back to your movies. Yeah, yeah, you wanted people to learn something. Yeah, you wanted them to participate politically, but you also wanted them to have fun, and you also wanted the next um, Brian and Mitch to be willing to give you money. <laughs> I'm not sure whether you wanted them to give you more money, but you know. But the next time you want to finance a film, you know, you want people to say, "Oh yeah, he's the guy who makes the really good, really really funny films." And so, one of the questions then is, what kind of storytelling is going to help people learn things, what kind of storytelling is going to make people want to take action, and what kind of storytelling is going to make you feel good about storytelling and make other people want to come back to you? I can ask those questions. I don't have answers. <laughs> You're the one <laughs> asking that. Um, but I, but I, you know, it, it is clear, we know, right, yeah, that emotion works for telling stories, that, that anecdote works in a way that data doesn't, um, or data don't. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and so the, one of the real big challenges for science stories is how do we take those anecdotes and do we stretch them a bit? You know, the Katrina one, you know, it really is, does raise the question of, yeah, it's powerful, but what does it have to do with global, um, global climate change? Um, and so in the end, I'm sort of wondering what kind of engagement you were trying to create, and um, uh, whether this is the best way to do whatever kind of engagement you were trying to create. I'll stop there. <laughs> okay. Um, wonderful. Whoops. Um, so let's see. Let me ask a fourth, probably most important question of all. Um, how many people thought that Dr. Chill was an actor? <laughs> And how many people thought he was a real scientist? <laughs> Evenly split. So there you go. Um, he's a real scientist. Could not have made that stuff up myself. <laughs> that is for sure. Uh, you wouldn't believe the guy. He's the sweetest, nicest man in the world. Uh, but that said, actually, here's a comment relevant to what you're bringing up here. Because what you brought up is really a complex thing, and I'll, I'll go into a little detail. We had the premiere of this film um, summer 2008 at the Outfest Gay and Lesbian Film Festival and Dr. Chill and his buddy came to it and they were standing around the lobby beforehand all smiles and they came in and then they, the two of them got up and stormed out in the, in the movie right in the middle of the New Orleans segment towards the end and I was initially really concerned I was afraid that we had offended him by laughing at him and his house and everything that he had to say but my friends assured me, no, and you know, it was on him. He, he was roaring with laughter with his friend. Um, and then like a week later, and then guys told me at the party that night, they said, no, he was really upset about the New Orleans thing. And then a week later, he called me up. He said, Dr. Olson, you make a great movie, but you got to get rid of all the New Orleans stuff. That's very unfair. Um, so what's interesting to take a close look at there in terms of this thing is, first off, the medium of film is large and unwieldy and a lot of films get made and people thought they were saying something and then the audience picks up a different signal um, that happens a lot and the truth is if you listen to this film the narration and the information point by point um, which granted there isn't that much as you point out but it's it's 100 percent accurate and naomi oreskes and i got into a little spat after the woods hole screening of the film and she demanded that i change the one thing about you know how certain we are about hurricanes are going to get larger in the future but the narration is accurate but the imagery tells a different story and that's what you were picking up on more was the imagery than the text and the same thing happened with Al Gore's movie with the subject of the island of Tuvalu and that's the one giant mistake that most people agree on is in that movie there's a whole bunch of things that are called flaws and then that's the one big error error which is that um he projected through the imagery that Tuvalu was being abandoned right now because of sea level rise, which wasn't correct at all. But you saw this footage of these people boarding boats as they talked about these island nations that will be losing land with sea level rise. So it's a delicate art between, and for all the communicators here and filmmakers, you've got these two channels to communicate through, the, the picture um, and the sound. And the picture, the visuals, are way more powerful than sound. So if I show you one thing, tell you another, what you'll all walk away with is what I've shown you. So as a result, what we said, technically speaking, in the movie with the narration is we went to New Orleans to see what it looks like, a climate disaster in a, in a developed nation. 
but what everybody picks up from it is that, and all the time I get this, you know, oh, you were trying to say that, that Katrina was caused by global warming. We don't say that at all in there. And yet that, if you read it through the imagery, it is saying that. And so I'm, you know, I'm kind of at fault in that regard as you're, you're picking up with that. Um, and then let's see, I don't know, in terms of your, <laughs> your comments, which are wonderful, um, the, you know, I didn't have much of an agenda uh, uh, with this movie aside from, it's a totally independent movie. This is a throwback to the 1970s when people made movies without worrying about audience feedback, without worrying about getting the next movie financed. Nobody finances my movies anyhow. I have nothing at stake. It doesn't matter. The science and environmental world have never supported anything I've done. They don't support innovation. So I have given up at this point. I just do whatever I want. I go and do other things to make some money. And then this cost me $120,000. There was no advisory panel, no review panel, nobody checking out the science, no nothing. It was just me and these crazy five or six guys making it up as we went along. We had a blast with all the improv stuff and we shaped it into a story um, without any agenda other than it is really kind of a junk pile for a lot of my complaints against the environmental movement. Um, it's my complaints about the lack of, of demographic diversity in ethnicities um, and even uh, sexual orientation, you know, there is no gay environmental movement for the most part. This is the first environmental movie they've had at Outfest as far as they know. Um, and furthermore, just lots of complaints about the superficiality of the environmental movement, particularly in Hollywood, on and on. Just, you know, it's riddled with complaints. The use of polar bears to raise money for all these money-making eco-corporations that have cropped up nowadays. Um, I can go into great detail of, of, it's a really kind of bitter and nasty film beneath the surface. So it was just my kind of artistic expression. And last but not least, there, there is an artistic element to it overall, which is when you stand back and look at the picture that it paints, it is an ugly piece of crap, basically. Al Gore's movie painted a beautiful picture. You know, we figured it all out. This is what's happening. We're causing global warming. We're all in agreement now. And there's one moment in his movie where he talks about Naomi Oreskes' science paper and 900 and some Science, scientific papers, all of them are in agreement. Every scientist now agrees, you know, that climate change is happening, we're causing it. Now we're all gonna get to work. And I personally think that there was a sort of undertone to that movie that was insulting to the entire climate movement, or climate deniers, deniers climate skeptics, whatever, that added to the flames, the fires burning inside them that resulted in climate gate. And, you know, you just don't do that. When you've got this enormous, by, by 2008, the oil and, oil and gas industry were spending $400 million a year on lobbying in Congress. It was not a trivial, you know, opposition, uh, opponent. You don't make a movie in which you try and just ignore them. That's what you get as a backlash. So, as a result, the landscape today, it, it's, it's a disaster. You know, this is the worst thing that's ever hit the science world. The entire consensus of all the greatest minds on the planet and climate science have said, this is what you need to do. And the American public is just saying, no, we don't. You know, they're not, they're not following any of that. Could there be any worse scenario for the entire world of science than to put their best minds together and not be listened to? So that's my feeling overall with the movie is it's a big mess and that's my perception of it today. So, the, I mean, there's a really interesting thing here, which is, right, just seeing you just get worked up. <laughs> but, but I'm serious, because that, I mean, that, that is, as you said, you, were, you had an artistic goal here, which was you had a passion that you needed to express, and this happened, happens to be your medium, right? So yes. filmmaking. Um, and so presumably, and yet the particular issue that gets you worked up is you want people to care about this. You want people to, to see that there's this mess and that people are not, um, including the science community, are not engaging in the debate in a way that they should or engaging with their critics in, in the kind of way, which gets to that second of those kinds of engagement that I talked about, the participatory engagement, the participatory democracy. And so it, to me, it still raises the question, is this the best way? This, from, for those of us who are, who are not trying to be artistic. But no, but no, no you're, you're contradicting yourself there because this wasn't, uh, you know, and that was not the, the agenda at all, that second question. This was simply artistic expression. This was not meant to be a motivational film to get people charged up to want to go do something about climate. That's the responsibility of these groups that sp have spent now over $1 billion has been spent on this climate issue, and today they have nothing to show for it. You know, hundreds of millions of then, dollars spent on cap and trade. Then why, did, then why did you come here this week? Uh, to have a good time. <laughs> um, because these things, 
they're important. But this this film is different in that regard. You know, this is not. I have other films uh, like the P public service announcements um, thing I did with Jack Black and the the, the tiny fish ones that are more goal oriented and they are motivational. The, the tiny fish PSA tells you at the end, you know, go to this website to learn more about the issue. So I know how to do that if I want to, but this was not an action oriented film. This is a piece of, this is an editorial basically and commentary on this is my view of what you people did with all this money that has been raised for this issue. You've squandered it with really bad communications and you know, I can go on and on with the critique of the Al Gore movie, which it's just unfortunate, and they're, they're good things that it did, you know, created some, um, some awareness, but it failed to tell an effective story. And more importantly, this environmental movement with all this money is not investing at all in variation experimentation, anything like that. Last night we talked about natural selection. You need to have wide variation for the selective process to operate on. But there's a report that came out in, in February this year from Sarah Hansen that was a critique of the entire in, in climate movement right now. And one of the things to point out was how conservative the foundations have been. They've been they've, everything they've invested in has been backed by metrics, numbers. We won't give you any money unless you give us data to show you how, show us how this is going to work. So you could never get a dime of support for a, a creative idea like this or any of the things that I do. And so that's, you know, the problem with me is I'm still driven by this naive belief that there's a value to doing things that are original and, and innovative like that but the selection against them is so powerful. And the net result is this failed climate movement that we have, and this is not me saying it, you know, there are tons of reports, Matt Nisbet's report last year, Climate Shift, documented the staggering sums of money that have just been squandered, and so anyhow. Can I interject yeah. 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 Well, yeah. What would you suggest uh, that Barbara Miller's money Um, diversification to begin with, you know, as of even 20 years ago, um, the environmental movement had become very narrow in its demographics. And furthermore, the, the thing that was unfortunate with what happened with Al Gore's movie, um, again, was had they coupled that movie with 10 smaller scale movies made by, in the voice of other ethnicities, other demographics, all these other parts of society, you could have radiated out the voice of climate change and, and the issue into something more than just the voice of Al Gore, which is, you know, he's a hero for having taken the lead, but unfortunately he's branded the issue as the, the issue of affluent white male Democrat, you know, a politician. So there's been very little of that effort towards radiating outwards. Um, and again, so much of these large eco corporations are being driven by their fundraising, their base, and that's not me saying it's in these reports that are coming out. So it's about, you know, really at the simplest of all levels, it's about creating variation. It's spreading things out, diversifying things in a movement that has become very homogeneous. And, um, you know, another big thing in the last few days you can follow on Andy Revkin's blog, Dot Earth, is uh, Peter Kariva, the chief scientist of the Nature Conservancy gave a talk in which he went through in detail the same thing about the narrowness of the environmental community and a whole bunch of people have jumped on there beating him up over it, but I think he's absolutely right. Thing I would add is on, on the scientific side, I think the, a lot of the money is dominated by the global modelers, the computer modelers, and, and vast millions go into with the assumption that the more powerful computer we have and the finer grain resolution we can have, we can get more and more accurate uh, predictions of what's going to happen. Where very little has been done in the user community inter asking a farmer what information would you need to make a decision? Um, how big a change would it have to take for you to change your irrigation system or something like that? And as, the, as I think the Katrina example was a powerful example of, regardless of what sort of change happens, bigger issues of vulnerability are gonna determine the impacts and perhaps more attention needs to be spent on those vulnerability of, of segments of society that would have a much more like, a much greater impact on the overall change we experience than a, a, a new version, eight version of the, the local climate model that would come down. Yeah, th there's another point on, on Katrina, um, which is the, the other handicap the environmental movement has grown into is a lack of leadership. Um, it is 
headed up by 10 to 20 of these large NGOs with staggering amounts of money, and they don't work together. And this is a, a fact. Two years ago, I was at a workshop in D.C. of 60 people getting together to discuss how and why did this climate issue collapse. The last piece of legislation had been withdrawn in August 2010. And during that day, one person said, you know, within the Beltway, there are at least 20 different groups today communicating about climate change, but each in their own different way with no collaboration, no coordination. And after, among other things, after Katrina, two to three months after that happened, in a perfect world, what would have happened was the heads of the top 10 environmental groups would have held a joint press conference in New Orleans and spoken to the nation and said, this is what happens when you don't manage your wetlands. These are the consequences. This is what we can learn from this experience. But they will never do that because these are competitors like Coke and Pepsi and eco corporations, and they're all in the business of raising money. So they won't collaborate. They won't join up um, at a large scale like that. And that handicaps the movement as well. That's, that's the institutional engagement. They need them to come back to their own organizations. I mean, I agree with you. They, to their own organizations, not to the, the educational engagement. Or the, or the policy Wait, discussion. Say, say, so on that one more. Part of why they won't work together yeah. is because they need you, because they need to maintain their own separate identities yes. for institutional reasons. They need you to give your money to them, not to that other group. Uh, yes. Um, you know, it, it, I espouse this simple principle from, that I learned from a communications professor that broad communication is simplest two things, arouse and fulfill. And then in my book, I've got the four organs. And my basic belief is that the sciences live up here and the arts are down here. Um, and the sciences deliver the substance. The arts can deliver the arousal. They've got the ability to reach inside of people. And that's, that scene in the beginning where I'm talking with the two producers on the balcony and the guy says, you know, we're really, really worried about global warming. We just don't know why. Well, I wrote that as an abstraction of 20 years of dealing with these Hollywood celebrities. And it's over and over again. That's the situation. They're so passionate about these issues. They've got the ability to get everybody all worked up. They just don't know why. And you go to these events in Hollywood and, you know, everybody's fired up. But then you're like, what's the issue? Well, you know, it's something to do with something going on in Africa. I don't know what it is. Um, so they're great at that part the arousal, they just don't have the fulfillment. And then scientists are reverse of that. You know, they can give you all the substance, they just can't get you fired up. So that is my overall theme, why the science, more than anything else, the science world has got to start reaching back to the humanities because they're stuck without this ability to connect. And these are the manifestations of the past 10 years, I think, you know, the evolution issue, this issue, over and over again, my neighborhood this week, I live in a little town called Malibu, California. They have a controversy going on, the Malibu Lagoon, and the environmental groups have all this money to do this, re uh, this restoration project of the lagoon. Only the local people have risen up against it, and they have turned into an anti-science movement. And this week, they managed to convince the whole city council to pressure the mayor to write a letter to the governor asking them to cancel this whole thing that's based on 10 years of science. And I'm getting to see it at the neighborhood level. The, the idea, it's a tea party type of thing where they're rallying and they're using emotion to now veto rationality. And you know, if it happens at that level, um, and then there's an you know, editorial today in the Los Angeles Times about the same thing for the nuclear industry. Um, emotion trumping rationality. Do we want to live in a society where emotion can trump irrationality like that? Well, I don't think, I mean, I think the point was more not trumping, but should we be trying to marry yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. You know, using, using the emotion. And, you know, it's really important for us to remember that to be emotional is as human as to be rational, right? We, we, we are emotional beings. And so... But what is the reverse true? <laughs> probably somewhat. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I think the question of using art is, a, is in, in any of its forms. Um, I mean, I know people who are using art when they're talking about nanotechnology or whether they're talking about biotech or the new, some of the new synthetic biology stuff, which, where the art is the bio um, stuff. And, and part of that are attempts to say, well, you know, these don't have to be separate worlds. They can be things that happen together. 
we take one more and then uh, we'll thank our panelists. Uh, follow up on that, which relates to the evolution movie too, is at what point is it so much about messaging that it doesn't matter which side had better facts? I mean, if the other, if the, the folks that are anti-science or just have a, a, a vested interest in not doing anything are so well invested in are, mm -hmm. that they can convince the vast majority of people that either there are no facts or the facts are these made up facts, then we're screwed. Well, I guess I, I will, yeah, I'll, I'll bring up a practical side of that, which is for starters, I'm telling about this local Malibu Lagoon issue, and last year the editor of the local newspaper, who's completely on the side of these opponents who are anti science, she wrote this you know, relatively powerful essay about today, scientists and lawyers are no different. They're the same thing. You can go out and hire a lawyer to argue any side of a case. You can go out and hire a scientist to argue either side of a case. Now, I am on this big committee with one of the major science organizations, and the last time it met, I tried to say to them, you know, do you realize this is a sentiment that's growing in the land? And it's not true. The scientists and lawyers are not the same. They're not the same profession. There is a real world basis for science. Law is really about interpretations and opinions and all that sort of stuff. And the profession for starters ought to be, the science world spends all this time trying to explain what science is. Science is a way of knowing, yada, yada, yada. That's not storytelling. There's no narrative structure to that. You can do a more effective job by telling us what science is, not how it distinguishes itself from other, you know, comparative way. And this is how science is different from law, is that science is based in the real world and these sorts of things. And therein lies the problem. If the science world allows itself to be drawn into this basic broader belief that it's just opinions arguing back and forth, then they've lost all their strength and they are gonna be just, is that making sense? You know, it's just gonna be like, they might as well just be a bunch of lawyers. But I don't know that the science world knows how to bring to bear, am I making any sense with any of that? About what science is? Somewhat, but again, I wonder whether it's um, whether we're whether we're getting at the question of what this was that we just saw. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the the whether the sort of using um, because now you're talking about what the scientists should be doing and the science what, profession, science science, science science profession, yes. what the science profession should be doing, whereas. Again, you're trying to have it both ways about whether this is just your artistic expression or whether you have some outcome that you want as a result of your artistic expression. And I think that that's the ch part of the, the challenge here. I don't know, Kiko, you have a sort of... No, I was uh, just trying to think about, in the sense of going back to global warming, that if it's an abstract concept, we tend to argue on emotion. So bringing it down to something that the people can experience in their own li local life, they're more likely to apply the facts to it, I would think. And so I think the Katrina example was, was a way of doing that. But how many people think we had a warm winter this year? <laughs> okay, hemispherically, globally, I hadn't seen the final stat. I think it was fairly close to normal. The US had an unusual, incredibly warm winter, but Europe was deep in blizzards and, and so, with global warming, we, we take our own local experience and project that as being the rest of the globe must be hot today. Or, um, and I think, so it's, it's harder to get, it, there's, a, there's a, hard, a difficulty in the argument of you have to bring it down to the local level to have someone appreciate the truth of what's happening and yet the local isn't always representative of, of the larger picture. Um, so I'll, I'll do one quick final comment on all that. And I think to getting at what you're saying, you know, what, what is really the core agenda? My probably central item is about leadership. And what concerns me is the science world has, is very bad at leadership. And there's a need for leadership on this issue because you're not going to be able to get the general public to process what these models are and to analyze them critically. At some level, they have to concede that this is beyond our capability of comprehension, we trust the best minds. So it's crucial that those best minds are able to come at the public with a voice that is likable and understandable and that they will trust. And that's the problem with the Al Gore movie is that storytelling is such a central element in broad communication and that movie failed to tell any sort of a story. As a result, it's six years later and virtually nobody wants to watch the movie. It could have been a really charismatic story, uh, a movie that told a story and not only that incorporated humor and emotion which are central humanistic elements of that, but instead, it ended up being 
this very flat thing that was just like a, a, a slideshow. And that's because it was rushed into production. It takes time to make a good story. So to get back to your question there, what would I do with the money? Uh, literally, what I would have done had they allocated the money is I would have hired the best screenwriters in Hollywood for a year to come up with a really good, compelling story that was had some genuine humor, genuine emotion, reached inside of people. And it could have been done. The, the materials exist for that. But they didn't, and the result is that we have this voice that is not charismatic, that people aren't willing to put their trust in it, and it's being assaulted at the same time. And so that, I mean, yeah, there's, that is kind of at the core is my belief in storytelling, its power and its importance, and that's really probably the central element of that. And that was the essence of these two days, the arts and the sciences. And I want to thank Keith and Bruce for uh, their participation today, and Randy for running this 48-hour marathon. <laughs> <laughs>